Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. With over 1 million high quality video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 25% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code FRAMERATE1213. In review, video Christmas card part two. Dancing in the front yard night and day, and the neighbors walk by, and this is what they say. Are these Christmas jammies? They are Christmas jammies. Check All it right, out. let's we go, go, go. Chance to rate the frames. I'm Tom Merritt, episode 153. You're Brian Brushwood. How's it going? Oh my gosh, it's going fan. I thought it was going fantastic. And then it turns out the Joneses next door have a more viral, more infectious, more committed Christmas minute. card video know. than me, sir. Going I on thought I had a lock on this. So you're saying that this viral video that we played before the show today about jammies and rapping is better than your holiday well, I'm Christmas? I'm not going to say it's I'm saying it's more infectious. It's certainly taking it to the next level. Boy, that's a I shaky booty I'm looking at. People judge this, Brian. <laughs> that's fine. Look, here's the thing. I love this idea of of creating video vignettes as Christmas cards. And and we our family came upon it like two years ago. We just did a little time-lapse video of us making cookies and a bunch of people told us how much they loved it. So it was like it was, next year, it was like, well, I guess we got to do it again. And so we did it each year. But I, I didn't know there was other competitors in this field. And now, after seeing that, I feel I feel small. I feel diminished in this year's offering, Tom. Well, but, but, but what do you got going on? Look at this. Okay, so you and Bonnie and the kids are all putting up a big white piece of paper, and you're creating you're creating like the lar- the g- most giant Christmas card ever. Well, it's it's a literal Christmas card, right? Because it's, that's the one thing time we had lapse, which is awesome. You have a beautiful house. You have a beautiful family. You're making a sincere (laughs) holiday wish. You can see the family coming together, enjoying the times, being silly. Oh, wait a minute. You know what, Brian? Sincerity wins. I think you just beat the jammy people all over the world. Well, as we know, Tom Merritt is the final arbiter of all things on the Internet. So as the Internet's arbiter, I accept your blessing, sir. Thank you for granting us the title. <laughs> hey, by the way, welcome to Frame Rate, the show that uh, wants you to be able to watch what you want, when you want, where you want, and how you want it. It is our final episode, but that doesn't mean we don't have a big story. This just in, the big story. Tom, this just in, tinyurl.com slash love frame rate. Tinyurl.com slash love frame rate is the place where you can find out what's that. Was that, oh, I'm sorry, was that not the big story? Did I, did I mess something up? That's a pretty big story, I have to say, uh, if people want to want to check that out. Uh, the other big story that, that I was referring to uh, oh. was Nimble TV. This is a... Uh, this is a uh, story up on uh, All Things D this week. Nimble TV allowing you now in New York City anyway, although apparently you don't have to be in New York City, but for people in New York City, you can buy access to a unnamed television service. Now, we know what they're doing. They're taking Dish satellite, they're installing it locally, and then they're streaming it out to individuals. So they're using that cable vision decision to say, hey, we're not rebroadcasting. We're taking individual accounts, and then we're streaming them to individuals. Now, Dish tried to shut these people down. You may have heard us talk about them before because they didn't want their branding associated with it. But since that time, Nimble TV has been very careful not to name Dish in any of their advertisements or any of their discussions, and they're back on. They're, they're, they're using Dish without saying it, and they're delivering that. They're also now doing something really weird to New York residents who already have pay TV with a- another service, like Time Warner Cable, For another $4 a month, Nimble will let you stream 24 over-the-air broadcast signals to your Nexus 5, 
or any other device, uh, kind of like Aereo, but they say we're not using the Aereo antenna thing. Yeah, and so keep in mind, Aereo, from the very beginning, appears to have been an entire business model created uh, on the idea of flaunting in the face of the nature of, of the technical demands for these things. Whereas it seems like what Nimble's doing is a little more coy, where it's like, look, it doesn't matter. Fine, we got one antenna. We're not going to say we have one antenna. All that matters is that you paid for it and just think of us like, um, you know, like a, like a sling box. Um, here's, here's what I'm really wondering, Tom, and, and I'm sure there's, there's more stories to talk about this, but are we entering an era where there is a legitimate place for in the market of ideas for somebody to be an arbiter, uh, a, an expediter to get you to your content better? And is there a dollar value for that job? For example, my parents briefly lived in Venezuela for a couple of years. And when we went down there, like if you had the money, there was so much BS to get through customs, to get through everything that there you'd pay an expediter who would just, if you had the money, you can get from point A to point B without much trouble. I feel like that's what we live in in the digital age now. And it's like, I if I have eight extra dollars around per month, I will pay somebody like an Aereo or a Nimble to please take me out of the miserable morass, which is the traditional television watching experience, either on cable or on broadcast television. And I, I guess that's the big question is, is are, we, are we entering a place where that can be recognized as a valuable service, or are we stuck in the morass of the legal entitlements and obligations of the 20th century, and we're just screwed? Uh, right now, we're kind of still stuck in the morass <laughs> of the legal entanglements, but I don't think it's an either-or. I think we won't be stuck in those for long. In fact, uh, related story, Aereo has, not totally surprisingly, but a lot of people thought they might go the other way, Aereo has agreed to let the Supreme Court take their case. A lot of people thought Aereo would say, no, we should wait until all the decisions are done in the lower courts. But Aereo says, no, you know what? We want to get this over with. Uh, the, the broadcast networks are trying to string, this, string us along and bleed us dry. So let's get the Supreme Court to rule on this. This does not mean that the Supreme Court will choose to rule on it. The Supreme Court still may defer and say, you know, we need to wait for these lower cases to be done. But Aereo has come out saying, please rule on this. While this is all still waiting to be decided, you have the nimble TVs of the world sneaking in and doing what you're talking about, Brian, saying like, well, you know, nobody's going to come after us right this second. So here, let's do this. And that's why I'm wondering, like, what does nimble TV think it's doing? If it's not doing the aerial model of we'll rent an antenna to you, a micro antenna, and it's just like a big, long extension cord. That's their argument. Is nimble TV saying, well, you're paying for the right to view the content already through Time Warner. So we're just going to piggyback on that, right? Because I don't think it, I don't know if they could make that fly in court if they got well, called again. On. What they're doing, and this is so much of what you know, the free market is is about, is recognizing an unmet demand. And if they perceive that there's enough people who want a clearer, easier way to get their content, then then they'll do it. For example, they, I mean, they basically say, look, just have some kind of New York address, and you don't have to put up an ugly dish on the side of your house. We'll get it to you over the internet using our dish. Um, and I, I think it's smart. I, I, this is one of those cases where uh, as ugly as it is, as illegal as it might be, this is a case where you are seeing disruptive technologies come about and win. It's, it's the free market in action despite all of the entanglements that are currently on the very restrictive nature of, of broadband distribution for, for television and cable. And I think we're going to see the wheels spin in that direction for a while until they finally settle the what what is going to be allowed. Uh, and, and we've got some information coming later this show about what Verizon might be up to, which could just kind of blow all this stuff out of the water, potentially. Potentially. I see what you yeah, did. Yeah, that's, that's something else that's not another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Another big story, however, is... That Chromecast has got new apps out. They've got Plex. Actually, they don't, the way Chromecast works, you can't really say they have new apps out. They have added compatibility to new apps. So Plex has added Chromecast compatibility. Vivo has added Chromecast compatibility. Viki, the international uh, TV provider that we've talked about before, they've added Chromecast compatibility. Real Player Cloud, which exists, 
has added Chromecast compatibility. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to store videos in the cloud. And there's a bunch of others in here. Um, Revision 3, Red Bull TV, Songza, uh, a few others, po Washington Post, Post TV. So they're doing this in waves, Brian. They're, they're, they don't have the SDK fully open yet. They're doing it in waves. And they say more waves are going to come. They've added the ability to take your Google Play content from your desktop and stream it now over Chromecast. You couldn't really do that before, exactly. There was some workarounds with Chrome tab syncing, but it didn't work very well. So now you can do that natively. And the company is saying, we're going to open the SDK next year. Uh, we're going we're to keep adding functionality to apps. We want to turn Chromecast technology into an ecosystem. They call the technology that works for Chromecast Google Cast. They want to work with electronics manufacturers to bring it to other devices. So this, according to Google Vice President of Product Management, Mario Kiros, uh, he told GigaOM, our broader goal is for Google Cast to be established as a standard. They're, they're going head to head with AirPlay and saying, forget being in charge of it. We want to make Google Cast be the thing that's in every device so you can effectively AirPlay anything from any app to any other device. Now, this is, I suspect, a very savvy rollout from Google. Now, keep in mind, Google is a company that is not afraid to make very visible mistakes. We see them with Google Buzz. We see them adapting with Google Plus. Even with Google Glass, they're putting stuff out and then kind of taking it back. We're like, well, that, wasn't a, that was a misstep. But again, like the Borg, Google eventually gets it right. And I suspect that part of the reason that you don't come out on the first day and let anyone do whatever you want for it, this is a company that already made the Google TV multiple iterations and is continuously trying to figure out what consumers want. Uh, and in this case, with Chromecast, they have a hit. And I think it's smart for them to make small moves going forward. And uh, in fact, it wouldn't surprise me if there's some part of Google internally that's trying to figure out like, man, why is Google... Uh, Chromecast doing so much better than Google TV. What is it that people are responding to? And I could see a world where where Google Chromecast is built into televisions and you don't hear people like me complaining about it, where it's like, it's ubiquitous, it's so small, it's so slight, it has such a small focused purpose that it doesn't feel bloaty and heavy and, and slow and stupid the way that like the Samsung smart TV interface feels to me. Uh, and I I think that this is Number one, kind of the coronation of them understanding that they have a winner and people are interested and a smart way for them to make slow moves in that direction to where, yes, it could be ubiquitous. We could take everything we love about the Chromecast and make it available on all platforms. And again, being so small, so svelte, so cheap, this is the kind of thing that could be built in. And now all of a sudden you stop seeing these competing platforms for televisions, you know, with, with, with terrible UIs that make me angry. And instead, you get something that uh, that feels small and familiar and moves moves quickly. Oh yeah, I I don't even think this is a puzzling thing inside Google personally. I I think, uh, and my wife works for YouTube, but I I don't have an insight on this particular story. I think what's going on is they said Google TV, we're not going to totally trash you because we learned some things that might be useful in Android because it's based on Android, we're going to take that, we're going to put that in the Android department, which is what they've done. Google Google for Android television services or some name like that. Right. And then they said, you know what's better? Dial. Dial is the streaming service uh, that they're using for Google Cast. They very smartly came up with a very cheap $35 item that people are using all over the world, even though it's totally in beta, well, all over the United States world. Or I, I think they're using it mostly in the United States because that's all it's available in right now. But they're, they're using it in droves, is my point, and they're doing a beta test for Google. That's what Google does, right? They're, and they're doing that again. And so the idea of saying once we've learned that and we've got enough apps working with it, if we partner up with manufacturers, they'll build it in. We'll be able to still sell ads on that stream, take a cut. People use YouTube. People use Google Play for that. It's brilliant. The only thing I would say is don't call it Google Cast. Call it Chromecast because that's the name people are becoming familiar with. And if you say, hey, this TV has Chromecast built in, you don't have to buy a $35 dongle. I'm like you, Brian. Instead of saying, oh, stupid smart TV apps, they never work. I'll be like, oh, I know that works. So it's nice right. to have it already built in. Right. Well, and plus also they can make that leap when, uh, you know, the, the iPods kept getting smaller with the iPod Nano until finally they became invisible and instant when they were built into your phone all of a sudden. And 
Chromecast is doing a great job of building value when you associate it with a little tiny stick thing. And technologically, it's going to be very easy to make that stick completely vanish and be just inside the television. And that is something I will buy in a way that I don't currently buy it with the Samsung smart TVs. Big Jingy says you can get it in UK. Janice Kusevin says you can get it in Finland. I think those are unofficial ways of getting it. Could be wrong about that. But yes, you can get it around the world. Thanks for that, Chavron. Hey, uh, Brian, you know who loves us? Um, our fans. Our fans who are going to tinyurl.com slash love frame rate. That's how we know we love them. Is or They True love enough. us. True enough. But you know who else loves us? Nobody. Nobody else loves us. Shutterstock.com loves you, Brian. All right. Now you say that. But I'm like, if Shutterstock loved me, then they would have millions of clips available for you anyone can choose from at any level. What? More, more than 1 million high quality stock video clips, 2D or 3D animations and motion graphics, Brian. Okay, fine. If they loved us, they'd be adding more to that library. And I don't mean like a dozen a day. I mean big numbers. Uh, you mean like 12,000 video clips a week? Oh, that, yeah, because that's that what they're doing. Like a lot. Okay. If they loved us, they wouldn't give that job to some robot. They'd have an actual human looking at it to make sure they had good quality. Yeah, that's why Shutterstock reviews each video individually for content and quality before adding it to its library, Brian. <sighs> wow, that's big. Okay, now here's the thing, though, all right? If they loved us, they would give, they would give us money and they would, like, freaking, like, have some kind of promo code so that people at home could use high-quality stock photos and videos in their projects. We could get them a discount. They would look good. We would look great. And they'd be supporting this show that ends today. Would you like, I don't know, maybe give those fans that you were saying we love and love us 25% off? Would that satisfy that part of the deal for you? I mean, that's like, that's like, that's almost a quarter, Tom. I mean, 25% off any package, whether it's individual clips or video packs or anything. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's then fine. Do. I believe you. This is, they, they love us. But the question is, how do you feel about them, Tom? I love them too. Actually, I have made uh, a website and two book trailers using Shutterstock. The video at Shutterstock is amazing. You can share it into a clip box and then you can actually take it and, and you figure out which clips you want. And then you just download the clips you want. You only pay for the images you use. So go Try it out. Sign up for a free account. No credit card needed. Just start an account. Begin using Shutterstock to help imagine what your next project could be like and save your video selections you find to your clip box. Once you decide to purchase, use offer code FRAMERATE1213 and new accounts will receive 25% off any package. That's Shutterstock.com for 25% off new accounts. Use offer code FRAMERATE1213. We thank Shutterstock for their support. A frame rate. Right on. Do do stream? Well, 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 it's Christmas time. It's the holiday season. And you know what people want to do, Brian? They want to pull out those old favorites, those old videos that they bought, I don't know, last year, the year before. And Amazon's perfect for that because you can buy those videos, you store them in the cloud. You don't have to worry about syncing them and digging up the device you put them on last year. You sit right down with your family and you watch a good old Christmas movie unless you're trying to watch Prep and Landing 2 Naughty versus Nice because Disney pulled the rights for it. Uh, yeah, this is a case where, of course, it's uh, the story here is Big Bad Disney yanks the rights to Christmas movies right before Christmas. So people who thought they were buying it and entitled to get it forever don't. Now, the article in Boing Boing, um, I guess uh, we found it on Boing Boing, uh, and the, the, the issue is uh, they say, yes, Disney is stupid and evil for doing this. But when Amazon decided it would offer studios the right to revoke access to purchased videos, they set the stage for this. And basically they're saying, hey, Amazon, you brought it on yourself. To which I say, Amazon knows exactly what they did. And they know that consumers are not going to blame Amazon when there's somebody that Amazon's able to point the finger to. This was, I suspect, an extraordinarily savvy move on Amazon's part where they were able to say in the negotiations for let us distribute the stuff, have it in the cloud, you can revoke it anytime you want. And I think it was smart for them to do that because they knew that when they did revoke it, Amazon will bear none of the blame. It will be the studios that get it. And in this case, it's yes, Disney is the one that revoked it right in the middle of the Christmas season. Yes, uh, Amazon is wise 
to shift blame onto Disney. And yes, Disney deserves the blame because they're the ones who yanked the access. So I suspect Actually, I think Brian, this is all great. None of that is true. It's all been a terrible misunderstanding. According to Ars Technica, Amazon wrote to Ars and, and the guy that this happened to, by the way, uh, whose name was Bill Jackson in Wisconsin. Amazon wrote to them and said, the problem you experienced was a temporary issue with some of our catalog data, and it has been fixed. The, the customer service person who told you it was because Disney yanked it for exclusivity was misinformed. Uh, if you still have problems, please let us know. Customers should never lose access to their Amazon Instant Video purchases. If they have any issues accessing purchased videos, they should contact customer service. Although apparently they may be misinformed. Right, yeah. Make sure to call customer service so customer service can verify facts that they later will say were never true. Are you kidding me? Is this, uh, this is one of those damned if you do, damned if you don't. Either they're lying and manipulative or they're incompetent. And I'm not okay with either of these. Well, and plus, if you remember, Brian, think back. Oh, not that far ago, end of October, when we had that story about Disney and Pixar movies being pulled from the iTunes store. And then the update came back. Disney has been in touch to say that while they do vary the availability of movies for streaming, the removal of purchased content is a glitch, and Apple is working to resolve it. So it's happened to Disney now twice. Two different providers, think, Apple and do Amazon. Do you think this is like a savvy, like Disney has the muscle to be able to call and say, look, don't you put this on us. We can't have that on our reputation. You call it a technical glitch and then you're done and then hangs up on them. I wonder, I wonder, like, did they pull the rights and say, look, we have the, we have the rights. We're covered. It's in the terms of service. If anyone complains at all, though, we'll just put it back and call it a glitch. Did they do that? Or did they say... Or did they really just say like, uh, yeah, just uh, change the catalog data for that, not realizing it affected the streaming copies that are streaming from your cloud service? Remember, it's only the streaming copies that you lose access to. If you downloaded the movie and had it on your device, you can still play it. It's the ones that you access in the cloud. And so there's this weird variability. And frankly, Brian, I don't think it matters what actually is going on. The problem here is they have the right to do it. So if they want right. to do it, even if they change, even if they're like, like, ooh, well, let's call it a glitch now. Later on, they might decide not to. And the fact is, you can't trust them to keep it up there. You're not owning anything when you buy under those terms of service. Right. Well, and keep in mind also that, and, and my my point, I I hope still stands that that if and when, like, I I do feel like distributors like iTunes and and Amazon give power or or the perception of power to the content owners by saying you can revoke at any time. But I think that's a Trojan horse. I think that's a bogus element because when they do recant, we live in an age now where it's not Amazon who's going to get in trouble for it. Everybody's going to know that it's the content owners that are yanking it and refusing to make it available. Well, and plus imagine this, Brian, okay? It, this, we're not talking about one person. Sometimes we talk about these companies as if there's you know still a Mr. Walt Disney and he makes all the decisions. That's not the way this works. So imagine if it goes like this. Guy in the database says, okay, the instructions say pull all the streaming rights. So that looks like streaming. That looks like, oh, that looks like streaming, even though it's cloud access for a purchase, and pulls it. Mm -hmm. Then Amazon goes, oh, you guys pulled the streaming for the cloud version. And the manager, who's not the guy who pulled it, says, oh, well, okay, do we have the rights to do that? They're like, well, yeah, but it's a little different thing. He's like, Oh, but that's good because that'll make them want to watch it on, on the channel. So that's okay. Just leave it, right? It's not maliciousness or intention on either end. It's misunderstanding and opportunism that can lead to exactly the same situation. I'll tell you what, man. Uh, it all boils down to I've watched The Wire, and now I understand how that kind of – that scenario you painted is utterly believable, and, and it's watching – The Wire will change your life. That's our <laughs> legacy, Tom, is everyone Somehow who has we had started to watching The Wire as a result of our experience. You knew we couldn't get through this without that. All right, let's move on to Tube Tops. Giga Ohm has a story about the uh, founders of TiVo, who are no longer at TiVo, uh, Michael Ramsey and Jim Barton, are about to release a new device called QPlay. Now, not a lot of details are known publicly about QPlay, uh, but it looks like, according to GigaOM, it'll work with Netflix and Hulu Plus, and that according to what they've told various sources, 
uh, things like That's Not Funny or Envisioneer. Uh, they say that people are going to use it to make playlists, to share playlists. It won't actually host content. It'll be controlled by an app, but it'll stream the content. So it sounds a little bit like Chromecast meets a second screen app somewhat. It's kind of hard to get your hands around, but it, it connects to your TV through HDMI, is controlled by by your smartphone or your tablet, not by a remote control, and you set it up with Wi-Fi, and it will have Hulu and Netflix on it, apparently. So this year, I've read a number of nonfiction books about great innovators who have fundamentally changed marketplaces. Uh, you, you read about the guys who invented Superman, and then after they left DC on, on you know, mixed terms, they, they're not worried because they know they could just invent another Superman. Turns out they couldn't. You read about the folks who create, uh, you know, televisions and, and um, you know, the fo uh, folks at Western Union's not worried because they're convinced that they can create a, a competitor to the telephone because they did it once they could do it again. Turns out that's not the case. And it's it's a with a bit of a heavy heart from the outside. And keep in mind, I don't know the details about any of this, but looking at it from the outside, I suspect that the folks who created the TiVo recognized a fundamental, they took advantage of a very rare opportunity where technology had reached a point where they could address a, a fundamental way that television was disappointing the masses. And that's why TiVo worked so well and sparked all the imitators and the DVRs and stuff. That kind of fundamental insight does not happen very often. They're extraordinarily rare. And I suspect that instead, uh, number one, they're banking on their reputations as the guys who were co-creators of TiVo. Uh, and this sounds very much like a Me Too device in a very increasingly crowded marketplace. A marketplace so crowded that two guys were able to create an entire news program just to talk about all the competitors in this space. I, I do not anticipate revolutionary or really even interesting things about this device. But again, would love, love, love to be proven totally wrong on this. Before I agree with you, which I will, <laughs> let me just throw <laughs> something out there. Uh, Qplay... TiVo founders, not at TiVo. So this is not a TiVo product. Lots of vagaries about it, but it does seem like what they're going out after is findability. That is a big problem we've all complained about. How can I just know where stuff is? So we provide a better way to find and watch quality TV and internet video, according to Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield, and Buyer's website, which is an investor in this. If they were to get Amazon, which GigaOM suggests maybe they could, and they were able to get Hulu and they were able to get Netflix uh, and Hulu changed enough so that it didn't matter whether it was on Hulu plus or, or regular Hulu. You know, you didn't have that confusion. Suddenly the idea that QPlay, if they could crack it, made it easy to find stuff and get recommendations from your friends through social doesn't start to sound crazy. It sounds like something everybody has tried and failed at. And I, and that's where I come back to agreeing with you in the end, Brian, is I'm not confident that these guys necessarily have cracked it, but they might have. Yeah, okay, here's the thing, is TiVo came along at a time when they existed under the legal protection of essentially being a VCR, where 20 years beforehand, that issue legally had been settled. And technologically, you were able to make a new version of a VCR that had never been done before. So they were in the clear legally. They didn't have to worry about licensing rights or anything. And, and they took advantage of that window. Nowadays, it's clear that the problem keeping us from watching what we want, when we want, and whatever de device we want is not a technical problem. It is a legal problem. It is a nasty patchwork uh, of, 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 you know, this web of legal entanglements. And it's going to take somebody with special access to slice through all that. And it's not going to be a technical solution. We saw that with Intel. Intel, I guarantee you that the UI is gorgeous, that the experience for the user is amazing, and that what killed that project is, uh, is, is the legal entanglements, which is why, which is why it's being orphaned and, and is now a vassal of Verizon. Again, though. Somebody could crack the code on on findability, even with the legal quagmire that we're in. That could make a big difference. That could be a cool machine. Roku's got their attempt. It's not bad. It's probably the best one I've seen, but it still isn't it yet. So we just have to wait until we actually see what QPlay ends up being. Let's talk about film file instead. <laughs> Film fam, 
all about the things you will be able to watch, the shows themselves. That's the important part, right? BoJack Horseman, a dark animated comedy, will premiere on Netflix mid-2014. The show was created by Raphael Bob Waxberg, a, uh, according to NextWeb, relatively unknown writer, being animated by Shadow Machine. Those are the guys who worked on Robot Chicken for Adult Swim. And it will star Will Ornett, Will Arnett, not Ornett. The, no, no, no. It'll star people. one of two people, either Will, Will or Nett. Or Nett. It, to be determined. Will Arnett as a horse that has fallen on hard times after starring in a 96th com called Horsin' Around and tracking his adventures with a human sidekick named Todd, voiced by Breaking Bad's own Aaron Paul. So this is weird that um, this is a weirder play for Netflix because doing an animated comedy makes sense when you don't have a lot of money and you don't have a lot of presence because you could take... Uh, a lot of actors who are doing well in Hollywood have these these vanity projects. And animation is something that doesn't take a lot of their real time. So they're able to do voice work and lend their name to it and give it credibility, uh, which is why you saw a lot of stuff go into, you know, Funny or Die style animated shorts or uh, everyone having their own YouTube channel. Um, part of what's made Netflix so successful with their originals is that they've done what's not obvious and what's not cheap. Uh, you know, with with House of Cards and Orange is the New Black. So I'm a little bit surprised that they would go with this, m mainly because they didn't need to, which which tells me, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, I don't know what to think about this. I mean, I'm sure it's a fine play be, and That'd it's be not going to cost them money or credibility. Maybe, maybe this is something that could just fill in their release schedule so that they keep having originals because I, I, I don't know. What, what's your take? Let me tell you what to think about it, Brian. Okay. I don't mind. Okay. Here's what you should think. Brilliant. Here's why. First of all, the fact that it doesn't cost a lot of money to do animation is debatable. I, I don't know enough about animation to know that, but I'm going to take that as like, sure, does it cost less than House of Cards? Probably should. So, okay, let's say it costs less money. Now, let's say Netflix is not HBO. Here's the big advantage, and Netflix doesn't talk about this a lot. I think it's smart that they don't. HBO gets people to subscribe to HBO because they're into one of the shows on HBO. And people think, oh, it's a channel. And I'm going to want to watch one of the things on that channel. And what HBO doesn't want to do is spread too far away and alienate their audience who's like, well, now they have some weird stuff on. I don't like watching that. They got to be careful of that. Netflix doesn't have to be careful of that. Netflix is a bunch of channels, in all honesty. It's the channel of people who like to watch rom-coms. It's the channel of people who like to watch dramas. It's the channel of people who like sci-fi shows. It's the channel of people who like political thrillers. It's the channel for people who like combinations of all of those things and more. And one of the things Netflix has is a bunch of animation. This is their adult swim. They're saying, we got a bunch of people watching things like Archer and the regular show and, and, and all of that stuff. Let's make an original for them. And I think that's absolutely smart. Yeah, I, and, and to be honest, you're right. And when I think back to, you know, one of the plays, obviously Netflix has full on said we plan to do exactly what HBO did. And one of the things HBO did, especially in the early days, was to uh, take experimental comedies that were relatively cheap to produce, like not necessarily the news, that kind of thing, to round out their, their entire uh, brand. And I think that's what they're doing here with Netflix. So, yes, I'm on board. I'm in. All right. Time for scan lines then. Let's fire it up. Uh, scan lines where we take 60 seconds to talk about some other cool stuff. From Mashable.com, three Netflix shows earned six Golden Globe nominations. The Golden Globes, obviously, for movies and TV shows. Orange is the New Black got one nomination for Best Actress in a Drama. Arrested Development got one for Best Actor in a Comedy. And then they also got nominated for Best Drama, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Supporting Actor for House of Cards. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I suppose, to be expected. You know, a lot of times the Golden Globe is the place where you see recognition for things that either got snubbed or just fell slightly short of what they were looking for at the Emmys. Um, good news all around, man. Congratulations to all of those Netflix originals. Do you, do, you, do you feel anything when you hear about Golden Globes nominations? I feel like Golden Globes is buzzier, even though it's less meaningful in the traditional sense. And so it's mm -hmm. actually, in some ways, better for Netflix to have this wealth of nominations in the Golden Globes. Because from what I can tell, the reaction online, people are like, ooh, they got Golden Globes. That's interesting. Like, yeah. well, they got Emmys. No, they got Golden Globes. You know, on top of it. It just, I don't know, keeps the buzz going for them. So uh, speaking of buzz, how about this news that Breaking Bad spinoff Better Call Saul not coming 
to any of your cable stations, at least not in the United States, but instead coming to Netflix. Now, the story is that uh, Better Call Saul will be a Netflix original, I assume, and uh, but not available worldwide. It's going to be specifically prohibited uh, from streaming in Latin America and in Europe. And uh, is that right? Am I reading that right? I don't know if I'm mixing this up. I don't want to report the news wrongly, Tom. Better Call Saul will be available to streaming members in Europe and Latin America shortly after its airing in the U.S. In the U.S. and Canada, the complete first season of the show will be available to Netflix members after its season finale on AMC. There you go. Now, uh, first of all, were you surprised by this? This, uh, I mean, number one, uh, Breaking Bad, I'll take an extension on this, uh, Jason. Go ahead and put me down. Breaking Bad uh, made news for the fact that people were using Netflix to go get caught up in anticipation of the big finale. So, in a weird way, people perceive, even though it's an AMC original, and AMC goes to great pains to remind everyone that it's an AMC original, most people, I suspect, I don't know, you think most? How You think more people watched on Netflix or on AMC? I think probably more people watched it on AMC total, but AMC leaned into the Netflix thing and said, that was great for us. It made more people yeah. watch it on AMC. So they're looking at it saying, that's awesome. We'll take that. We'll put it on Netflix immediately afterwards because we're probably going to get a cut of that too. So instead of running from Netflix, they're embracing Netflix. And I think that's smart. Yeah. So, and uh, it's just interesting to me that that in a weird way, Netflix was the big winner because you have an experimental spinoff and spinoffs are, all, are their own questionable answer or, or uh, element. Like AMC may not want to do a spinoff. It may not be in their best interest, but the fact that it immediately finds a home in Netflix, that's extraordinary. Yeah. It makes sense. For sure. And it points a way forward for other shows. Hey, uh, Apple got some new channels TV uh, added to the Apple TV this past week. Uh, ABC, although you have to have a cable subscription to be able to use the app on your Apple TV, also added Crackle, Bloomberg, and a Korean channel called Core TV. Uh, yeah, man. So uh, Crackle, of course, the Sony's offering... Uh, right now, I guess more po most popular for Jerry Seinfeld's comedians and cars getting coffees, right? That's apparently a very popular Crackle show, I am told. That's, uh, you know, I pitched Scam School to Crackle, and they said yeah? no. Yeah, no. They said no one will ever watch that yeah. show. That's right. And then, 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 and then we hit 500,000 subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that turned out to be a good call. Uh, congratulations, Sony. Congratulations, um, Apple TV. That's just but, new yeah. channels on Apple TV. There you go. Yeah. Let's move on hey, to Amazon. Uh, yeah, dude, shoot everything in 4K. Me. Yeah, no, uh, everything, they're shooting everything in 4K, which sort of legitimizes the platform. But weirdly, we, it's it's such a repeat of what we experienced in the late 90s when people would, or maybe early 2000s, where you knew and you could tell that content was being shot in HD, even though most of us couldn't watch it in HD at the time. Uh, we're seeing the same thing happen with 4K, where it's like, look, down the road, 4K will be a thing. So we want to make sure to record it now in there. How how big a deal do you think this is? You think this is a, a, a coronation of 4K as I, the successor? I don't think anyone was in doubt that 4K was going to be coronated as the successor. So this, to me, seems perfectly expected. Like, oh, yep, good, good call, Amazon. Get out in front a little bit. Shoot your stuff in 4K so that when it comes time to distribute that in 4K down the road on your own service and anywhere else, you'll have it in 4K. Netflix is doing the same thing messing around with 4K and figuring out, you know, how many people out there have it, how much bandwidth it takes. Yeah. Smart idea. Right hey, uh, Verizon could announce Intel TV deal as early as this week, according to sources. And we've been hearing this for a long time, so we'll see if it ends up being true. But the rumors are starting to mount. So it sounds like Verizon at least is serious about buying the Intel TV on Q service. Now, we got a note from Andy Beach who pointed out, and he wrote this in an analyst article that he wrote, Verizon now has a powerhouse combo of content delivery networks, Uplink and Edgecast, that provide an improved customer experience for those companies looking to transition to over-the-top and or monetize their video libraries. So you take what Andy's noting and saying, hey, they're going to get into helping people with their over-the-top video libraries. Then you look at this rumor and say, hey, guess what? Verizon's buying on queue which is an over-the-top video provider that was supposed to exist on the internet only. Brian, do we need an extension here for you to answer this question? Do yeah, you think but Verizon comes at you with the first internet-only television subscription service? Uh, yes. Extension over. Next story. 
Really? That's uh, all you got to say? Like, no, no, no. That, I mean, I, mean, I, mean I, I, think, I think the stage is certainly set. And by the way, it was, and uh, this is what I'll use my extension to complain about, is okay. it was reminded to me that one Brant Hughes, a.k.a. Gatawag in the chat, pointed out that I already owe you two stakes and might owe you a third stake by the time the uh, the year is out. The first stake, of course, was for uh, 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 the, uh, the Spike Lee Kickstarter. Second stake was based on the ending of Breaking Bad, whether or not he would do the Dr. Horrible ending or not, and that's debatable. Okay. But the third stake on, was on whether or not there would be an internet-only cable service provided. So if it does happen next week, oh, then that's one yeah. stake off my debt. This won't happen next week. They, they won't launch a service until at the earliest 2015. Whatever. If, I'm, they I'm, if they announce it, that's good enough. And to be honest, I'm going to make a case that that Comcast fake out that, that sounds like an internet-only thing, that I would make a case that that counts. Regardless, uh, Direct so TV. <laughs> Direct TV is pondering an online video service that won't compete with Netflix. And I got to admit, I was uh, details were a little bit sketchy in this article from Engadget. What does it mean to to launch a network that won't compete with another network? Well, because you know what, it this competes with it actually competes with Dish. If you don't remember, Dish operates an internet only service on Roku for foreign channels. So you can get you can get international service through Dish. You don't have to be a Dish subscriber. You just but you do have to pay for that. And I, I think it's pretty pricey. Like it's around thirty dollars a month to get international channels. There, so that's none of the domestic stuff. That's what this sounds like, according to the Wall Street Journal report. Direct TV is looking at coming up with a, a foreign service or or an international program licensing where it's easier to, to license the programs and then delivering that internet only. So you wouldn't have to have any direct TV equipment. Uh, right on is all I have time to say. <laughs> yes. Let's move on to the winter movie draft. Hey, did we get uh, the release dates wrong for Saving Mr. Banks and American Hustle? We said last week they were December 13th, but I, I think they come out uh, this week. And I have American um, Hustle. So. Yeah, well, normally all that stuff auto-updates, and it's listed here on the dock as being on the 13th. So maybe it is. Although I'm hearing exceptional buzz about Saving Mr. Banks. People are saying really good things about it. There's articles where it's comparing the actual Walt Disney's office to the one that they recreated. Um, uh, it was limited yeah. release. It was limited release. Thank you, the dork knight. So that's why we haven't seen a whole lot of money for it. Got it. And by a whole lot of money, you mean any money at all. But the big question so goes, is... American Hustle goes into wide release December 20th, and so does Saving Mr. Banks. So they were uh, technically Casey, released the 13th. Casey McKinnon, right now sitting at number two. She did very well with Gravity and is in a good position. Saving Mr. Banks about to go into wide release. And The Secret Life of Walter Mitty... I got to tell you, I think that Secret Life of Walter Mitty has a chance at being a hundred million movie, um, and uh, Saving Mr. Banks has a chance at being a hundred million movie. I'm going to say that the two of them together almost certainly will be over a hundred million dollars, which would put her above Justin Robert Young. Like we were under the 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 impression that maybe Justin was going to run away with this. Is that not the case? Uh, it does not look like the case. I, I imagine the Hunger Games will build up a few more tens of millions, but I don't think it'll put him over five hundred. It might, but even if it does, you're right. If she gets two two hundred, if she gets two hundred million movies out of this, she could catch him. I think that it's possible that those aren't hundred million dollar movies as well. Like I don't think they're a lock for that. I think it's possible. Uh, in which case, I think Justin can can still feel like he's going to win this thing. I don't think that we're going to see any challenge from Jeff Kanata. That was the other one. We're like, oh, he's got The Hobbit. Came out of yeah. the gate with $73 million, and I think it's going to be the same story as last year. It's going to do very nicely. It's not going to be the big tentpole movie that's going to be right there with what Gravity turned out to be and what we expected, Hunger Games catching fire. I'll tell you what, uh, Father Robert, uh, a, a more distant dark horse candidate, but still a player. He's got The Wolf of Wall Street coming out on Christmas Day. I don't think that's going to blow up and be a $100 million that's movie, but you never know. Too. Um, but Frozen I'll tell you, it's, it's, could win a few more dollars, but not that. Uh, many. I don't know. Uh, okay, all right, maybe it's possible. Anything's possible. Uh, Casey and Justin, it's their fight now. Uh, I think Casey's got a point. Now, here's the thing: if Justin were to win, then that gives him credibility with his whole argument that we have to break apart Star Wars in uh, the Winter Draft two years from now. I I don't know that that's the case though. If Casey wins, it sort of puts a knife in that theory and says, look, if anything was going to run away, it's going to be the Hunger Games, and that didn't work either. 
Uh, a lot of people always asking like, hey, what about the chat room side of this? You get chat room updates on the NSFW show at twit.tv slash NSFW. So you will definitely want to keep an eye on that to carry through on the winter movie draft through the rest of this. Because we've got Anchorman, The Legend Continues. We've got The Wolf of Wall Street, Secret Life of Walter Mitty, 47 Ronin from Jeff Kanata. Who knows? Dark Horse? I don't know. Yep. What's uh, amazing, real quick, talking about the chat realm competitors, if you look, if you could show Jason the uh, the document again, if you look, there's uh, first place is a Devious Always with a mix of Gravity, Machete Kills, Carrie, Jackass Presents Bad Grandpa, Free Birds, and Frozen, uh, Ben 32 has a different one. After that, it's like a 20 million way tie with Gravity, The Hunger Games, and uh, Gravity and the Hunger Games basically taking up all the money. All right, let's talk about what we're watching. <laughs> watching dude you watched axe cop where can you watch axe cop uh i walked in and of course uh zach holder lonely dot geek very talented mashup artist is uh currently started to work for me and he's crashing at my place for a while so i get to walk in when he's watching hulu caught a, caught a bit of the axe cop show and let me tell you man i understand that the conceit of axe cop and by the way if you're not familiar with axe cop you're a terrible person go look up axe cop right now read the first 20 issues and laugh your butt off. It's written by a five-year-old, illustrated by his 20-something-year-old brother. Um, I'm aware that any kind of Hollywoodized version of this has to be has to be written by adults who just capture the voice of the original show, or they have to base it on the original bits and go in different directions. It doesn't matter. Knowing that adults have their hands in it, I'm just a fan of the absurdist nature of the dialogue of how like intentionally terribly everything's written. It's awesome. I really enjoyed it. And I, I plan to go back, back and watch the rest of those. Oh yeah. They've got 12 episodes up there. Hulu.com. You don't have to pay. Don't pay. You don't have to pay. You can do it absolutely free. Hulu.com and watch Axe Cop. I'm, I'm definitely going to do that. Yeah. We're watching I, the animated comic book right now. That's available on YouTube, which is different from, from the, uh, the show, but still good. Watch everything related to Axe Cop and then play Axe Cop Munchkin, the card game. I saw The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug uh, this weekend. I did not see it in HFR. I did see it in 3D. I saw it at the Dine-In Theater, though. But the Dine-In Theater isn't the Alamo Draft House, so the food's more like a Bennigan's than it is the Alamo Draft House. Uh, <laughs> however, I thought the movie was better. Uh, it was still very much like Unfinished Tales meets The Silmarillion with scenes from The Hobbit. But it, it held together a little better. It had some more moving emotional parts. Uh, there's still, Peter Jackson really wants to like be funny. And sometimes that's great. And sometimes you're like, ooh, not, no, too much funny. Let's, let's get back to the drama. The drama is what really makes this. And then the funny sets it off. So I, I, I still don't, I still don't feel like this needed to be three movies. I think he has some really great scenes and really great parts. And it, could have benefited from being focused maybe two movies, uh, but possibly even just the one. Would you, if you had it to pick, would you rather see one movie or two? I mean, clearly not three. You're not a fan of, of how stretched out it is right now. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't mind seeing extra movies. Uh, in fact, I love Lord of the Rings extended editions. I love the really long versions with the extra stuff. But I watched The Hobbit and I felt like, oh, I hope they put out a reduced edition. So that I don't have to sit through all of that what, next time. What about you know, this? The, is, is, is there a chance that it would have changed things if you had if he had released all three movies simultaneously, where it's like every or week after week, like week one, week two, week three, and done something? Where it's the same content? I don't but think you that matters. So no. Yeah, I yeah? don't think it's that. I think it's just like I'm sitting through some stuff that I don't think is essential to move the story forward. You felt uh, genuinely bored. And, and it's that's not always crime. that it's not always the extra stuff that I'm bored by. There was some really good extra stuff that's not in The Hobbit that I'm like, oh, this is cool. I know this is this is from the appendix of The Lord of the Rings or this is from the Unfinished Tales. And I'm glad they're right. including it. I think it's great. Some of that stuff is good. Some of it's bad. It's just all overall the pacings for me, for me, just just my particular taste uh, didn't work perfectly, but it was better than the first one. Uh, and I still enjoyed both of them. I mean, it makes, I'm starting to sound like I didn't like either one of them. I liked them both. And I, I had a good time at the theater watching them both. I still like Lord of the Rings so much more. And that's what I'm comparing it to. Uh, oh. Also watched the Haven uh, mid-season finale. Which apparently they're, they're in danger of canceling Haven now. So there's a Save Haven movement out there. Mid-season finale wrapped it up with a good cliffhanger. 
I wish, I don't know. I wish a few things were a little bit different. I don't want to talk too much because I'd have to be spoilery. Uh, but I still love the show. It's a good show. Right on. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, you want to you mm-hmm. you drop a little feedback? Yeah, let's do now that. Now it's time for Feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Radio. Yeah. It's the final feedback. And congratulations Da-da-da-da. to Jason from Boston, uh, who is on it. He says, things I wanted to say before you ended. Number one, Quickster was a good idea. What? Hold on, people. Listen to Jason. Hear him out. He says, maybe then people that care about the quality of a picture and Blu-ray extras would have a good value proposition. Split up the company, one for disc, one for streaming, and I think there would have been use cases for each. Netflix was forced to buy neutered Blu-rays for rental. I would pay more for a service that had retail release Blu-rays. I completely agree with the sentiment. It's 100% right. The only thing that they did wrong was mis-evaluate the temperature for the announcement. They announced it at a bad time. Now, keep in mind, like we did a whole segment where I did like a crazy coked up version of Reed uh, Hastings, Hastings talking yeah. about how he, how he used to be worth $300 a share. And they're back there. So they recovered fine. But the way they got there, Netflix is only known for one thing. That's their streaming content and their award-winning originals, which is all they ever wanted to begin with. And the whole purpose of making Quickster was so they could get there. And so essentially by having everyone freak out about it, they just had to go a longer road, but they still ended up at the same place that they wanted to be. Now, his other thing was book spoilers. Brian, I can almost hear Tom grinding his teeth when you spoil the book version of Walking Dead and Game of Thrones. I can kind of understand what Jury does, and I learned my lesson to never listen to a podcast he's ever on again because of it. Wow, Jason, a little harsh there. Uh, But uh, he says, not from a host. Uh, Okay, first of all, screw you. I'm no better than anyone else. Um, And I say that with all love and affection for you. Here's the thing, man. If you're a fan of the uh of of the of the video version of something you lose nothing by finding out what happens in some alternate reality version it would be the same as if i spoiled for you what some fan fiction of walking dead said oh well as you know in the in the fan version of walking dead they all have an orgy by three page 3 that takes nothing away from your video experience. The entire thing that defines the Walking Dead adaptation in video is the fact that it is different from the source material. So if I'm going to talk about the source material, then in what way does that affect anything? Anything more than, uh, by the way, remind me to write some erotic fan fiction about the Walking Dead, Tom. I don't think that fan fiction and and canon source material are exactly the same, but I I agree with your point, which is like knowing what's going to happen isn't what it's about. It's about the journey. Remember that argument? Sure. You just no, agreed with I, me on that argument. I, I Well, whatever. I, I disagree with everyone on everything. Uh, <laughs> hey, man, we got one letter that says, there is no bigger news than the end of frame rate. You two better do a show together about cord cutting or else I'll be very cross and my wife will cry. I'm sorry, this just in. Sponsored announcement, tinyurl.com slash love frame rate. Tinyurl.com slash love frame rate. Important survey. Uh, oh, um... Just thought I would throw an idea out for you two. Can Steam save the HTPC? The Steam box is a PC and a game console that you hook to your TV. One would hope that Steam puts something like XBMC in the Steam store and then add it in Netflix, Amazon, maybe Google Play, of course, YouTube. Maybe the Steam box will be the one box to rule them all. And I guess that's the big question is, um, you know, we already have the experience we want on our desktop computer. We could go to all of the websites. We could watch all of the content. The only thing we don't like about that experience is the fact that it's in our office and not in our living room. And essentially, the Steam box is, of course, a, a PC in the living room. Uh, here's the thing. If it is the salvation of or the dream, the one box to rule them all, it won't be their stated intention to go for it. They've got enough on their plate just trying to wedge a place into the hearts of gamers by having a console that's a PC that doesn't obey any of the rules of success that have made for the previous generation of consoles. So it might happen. I don't know necessarily what to think, though. I, I, well, Steam, but, it, Valve has said they're going to have TV services on it. We just They haven't struck any deals, so they can't use the words Netflix, but they want to do that. 
So I think right. they should. Well, right. But, but, but also, uh, that's not what they're leading off. What they're trying to lead off with is the fact that, that they're bringing, you know, a superior, more customizable uh, uh, PC-like game system. You know, they, they, they have this, this uh, inventive controller that's going to allow you to play certain types of games that you could never play on a console before. Well, um, it's like the Xbox, though. How so? Xbox is a PC level gaming machine that also will serve you as a as a video machine. It's right, just that Valve's proposition is ours yes. will be more affordable and more capable. Correct. Yeah. In that regard, in regard to streaming television, then yes, you're 100 percent right. Uh we we have a very secret email here, Brian. Um, By the way, can I can I say that this is like my favorite thing about hosting frame rate are those brief moments when I feel like Industry insiders are listening to us. Like the fact that the fact that somehow I'm on the marketing PRs list for Aereo, and when they announced their intention to go to the Supreme yeah, yeah. Court, they emailed me directly. Uh, and and this email made me even more happy, even though I'm 100 percent wrong, as I often well, am. This this email come it comes with a lot of uh, a lot of safeties on it. It's going to self destruct as soon as I read it. It's Good. going to blow up uh, from from an extraordinarily anonymous person who said they were listening to Frame Rate. We were talking about TurboFast on Netflix. Uh, and they say, it's the first thing Tom mentioned. Very vague. Very vague. It's like an Umberto Eco puzzle. We have to, we have to go back and watch this because I couldn't remember what either uh, of us said about it. But then it becomes clear. Animation takes a long time to do. So I was saying, well, maybe it's just that the shows take a long time and they're just going to put them out when they have them done. This person says animation takes a long time to do. Believe me, I work on the show. We're the fastest studio in the West, and it still takes a long time to do this stuff. Also, when they say five episodes, they mean 10 because the episodes are 11 minutes long, but they package them together into 22-minute episodes. So the pilot is a 22-minute double-length episode. He's like, nah, maybe nine episodes. We're making them as fast as we can. Leave us alone. Yeah, right on, man. Well, thank you very much for giving us that insight. Uh, we've got an email from Joel. It says, hi, Brian and Tom. Love the show. Look forward to whatever you two do in the future. <laughs> Tinyurl.com slash love frame rate. Um, your discussion about a la carte cable solidified my thoughts on channels. Why do we need channels at all in the future? It hmm. seems to me like they're not just a middleman between, uh, it seems to me that they're just a middleman between money that funds the shows and creative talent that actually produces content. From my outsider's perspective, it seems like network executives mainly detract from shows by inserting groupthink, mass appeal marketing ideas. Net networks are just a way to collect shows into groups that don't often make sense and force them into increasingly meaningless time slots. I get that this rant is all pie in the sky, future looking, and most of America still watches what's on when it's on, but I'd love to see a future where video entertainment comes via RSS feed or something similar. Um, here, here's the thing is, is uh, practically you're 100% right, is the way that channels have worked is to cover the entire spectrum and be pure vanilla as far as they could go. But understand that a channel is in some ways in its most, theoretical, philosophical and, and iteration, it, it is essentially a brand, an algorithm for the type of things. And that's what everybody's jockeying for space. AMC wants to own high quality dramas that involve surprising, agonizing choices and interesting characters. TNT wants to own, or TBS wants to own light comedy that's, that's on at, at, at all times. The fact that these happen to be distribution platforms is independent from their branding exercises. And I'm going to suggest that that channels will be there forever. You will trust a certain channel. Revision 3 is a distribution platform or was, its main strength was a distribution platform, but, but now its greatest strength is that it is a branding platform because it lives mostly in the YouTube ecosystem where it means a certain type. And, and in fact, Revision 3 has figured out that, that when distribution is not part of what makes you a channel, you can make as many channels as you want, which is why they're making the Tech Feed Network, which is why they're making, you know, their the, the new Animal Planet uh, spinoff thing. They got the they got the test tube, the one that, that carries Scam School is, is for, for, you know, smart, quirky, sciencey kind of things. So in that regard, channels aren't going away. They're just becoming more of what they always wanted to be, which is brands independent from the distribution platform. I, I, I think you totally, I got nothing else to add there. Because I, I think that's why Netflix is going around saying we're a channel. As yeah. they're saying, that's because that's, we're the future kind of channel, right? 
where right. it's like, we're great for, for bringing you the things. Because remember, Netflix doesn't want to be comprehensive. They want right. to be bringing you the great things you love. So which, it's a not, new which, kind by of the way, channel. makes me think, Tom, that that within the next couple of years, we're going to hear about a Netflix 2, like a sub-channel built in within it, where there's a type of content that Netflix doesn't want to dilute their current brand value with. So they'll come up like, you know, like like, like Netflix Retro will, will be code for crap cheap programming bought in bulk but it's not really <laughs> netflix like like they'll, they'll i mean i mean yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of thing where it's like they don't want to ruin they don't want to sully the brand that they've built so they come up with something slightly different yeah you're not talking about like kids programming because they can always have that in the main netflix like oh there's kids sure. and there's drama there's something for everybody in netflix it's the greatest quality stuff it's something that is opposed to the brand proposition uh porn would be the the easiest example to wrap your head around I don't think Netflix ever gets into porn, but it would be something like that where like we just can't include this. And maybe the retro, the cheapy stuff is the best way to look at it. But we think there might be a separate market. So we'll come up. Well, nobody's using the name Quickster. Maybe we'll use that. And that'll be. <laughs> maybe <don't> so. <laughs> uh, hey, Tom, I don't know about you, but uh, what is this? 153 episodes uh, that all began with you and I just sitting around, kicking around, talking about how much we liked and what we didn't like about Battlestar Galactica it's amazing to see what this has become. This has been an incredible journey. And I don't know, I don't know about you, but I want to certainly thank uh, Leo Laporte and all the fine folks Absolutely. at Twit who were there from the very beginning. It's been uh, two and a half, three years now. Every, uh, every week, man, we get it together. And out of everything, the thing that makes me the happiest about this experiment is that you went from a guy I kind of knew who was married <laughs> to my producer on Scam School to one of my favorite people on planet Earth, and I'd like to call one of my best friends, and it's because of this frame rate experience, and that is something that that truly matters the most to me. Absolutely agree with everything you just said, unlike usual. Uh, I, I, I agree <laughs> that probably I, there's so many good things that have come out of doing this show, and that is right up at the top of one of the best is becoming friends with you uh, and being able to rely on that friendship. It's been amazing. It has been our privilege to do this show, and I echo thanks to Leo for giving us the chance to do it. It was very generous of him uh, because we know the show doesn't make him money uh, to allow us to, to do the show and to keep doing the show if we wanted. Uh, so big thanks to Leo. And that is it for this episode of Frame Rate. And all the episodes of Frame Rate, Brian. That's it. That's uh, let's say it again. Like, that's it for Frame Rate. Cut those cords, people. What's that URL? Tinyurl.com slash love frame rate. Fill out the survey. <laughs> See you around. Silent breed is people! Yeah, man. Spoiler alert. Frame rate's canceled. Show's over. What? You know in that last season when when frame rate was uh, completely removed and canceled? Did, did, <laughs> am I spoiling something here by saying that? Well, it was kind of a big shocker. It kind yeah, of came it, out of nowhere. No one, no one saw that one coming. Then they tried to be all meta by actually breaking down the shocking end to the series frame rate by doing a spoiler zone where all they did was really kind of point out how the show ended. And they did it all like in the present tense as it was happening real time, which I, I feel thought like was that, very- it was a real cop out, Brian. It was like <laughs> the two of them just couldn't confront the truth and be serious for just one moment. Ugh, worst episode ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's amazing. I am so sorry that I doubted you, Jason. I should have known you were intentionally setting up the joke. It just, I thought it auto-played and that we hadn't discussed it. And so I was like, I was like, oh, do the one obvious joke. I was like, I was like there has to be an end. Like, that, at least that that uh, that drop. At the very yeah. least, the drop, because I love that drop. So oh, got to make amazing. it into the last episode. <laughs> Title, uh, worst episode ever. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, man. Uh, hey, you know what? My one regret is that in the wrap up, we didn't get the chance to specifically thank, uh, Jason Howell, the, uh, the third oh, voice wow. of frame rate Absolutely. in everything. It's all um, good. Jason, do me a favor, edit this in Jason Howell. Once Jason joining the team and becoming the third voice of the show completed everything. And, uh, and he continues to save the day for us over and over again. Uh, thank you so much, Jason, for being there. Yeah. Yes. For as much as thank you, Jason. 
Absolutely. I mean, it's it's always a pleasure doing a show with both of you guys. I'm bummed to see it go, and I'm bummed to see all these drops not get used on a daily basis. Maybe you guys can use it elsewhere. You could do. You could do. You know what? Uh, just just throw them in other shows. Just <laughs> random. Just sprinkle. Just them like in. like I'd like to think our legacy is that is that you know uh, randomly they're like coming up next on on you Windows know, Weekly uh, the slipstream watches. and then it yeah Got then it. It, uh, all of a sudden something <laughs> else comes in. You guys don't understand uh, how much Jason is committed to this show. He. He wants to do this show all the time, and he gets upset and sad when he can't do the show, when he can't be on the show. You may not hear him a lot, but he's, his heart and soul has been in it. Uh, yeah, man, I'll tell you what else. Uh, people think that, that, that we, we didn't take our last episode seriously. Uh, we took it very seriously. In fact, uh, Tom did, uh, did some, some training for the last episode. We both trained very hard. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.